All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Clyde C. Pesada. I head up the education team at the Linux Foundation. Uh, so we're at a multiple event with OSS and KubeCon and LFAI. Uh, the education team operates kind of at the top level of LF, so we support all the different projects, including the AI projects, including the CNCF projects because what we typically find is the technical communities are super excited about writing code, but not super excited about developing courseware and education. And so our role is to help make sure that projects are equally successful when it comes to attracting new users and new developers, uh, and not just be focused exclusively on writing great code, because great code is important, but it's actually not enough. And so uh, today's session is about uh, talent management and the challenges of talent management in sort of the uncertain post-Gen AI uh, world. And uh, this is a version of a talk I've been giving quite a lot about the importance of how to go about uh, building talent. I think we've come through a long period where the primary focus has been on buying talent. And by buying talent, I mean you go out and you hire a net new hire sort of uh, uh, you know, in the U.S. it would be on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, trying to attract technical talent in versus developing talent in-house. And the thesis of this talk is that uh, organizations should really adopt what I call an all-of-the-above strategy. So, yes, go try to hire on the open market, but also pay attention to how you can develop internal t talent to, to fill the needs you have over time. Um, and uh, really broaden how you're thinking about uh, getting to a fully staffed place. Uh, oh, that projector is bright. Uh, so the, uh, we talk a little bit about uh, LF education already, and then I want to talk about a couple of big trends that are, that are intersecting, which is, is you know, what is still sort of a fairly global talent shortage, especially in some of the key areas, and how that, does that intersect with the sort of things we're seeing happening in AI and the implications that will have for how we think about uh, uh, talent and how those come together, what those trends look like. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the trends and some of what we see happening in, uh, in Asia and in China more specifically. And uh, feel free to ask, uh, raise your hand and ask questions uh, at any point. You don't need to hold them for the end. I think I have maybe about 20, 25 minutes worth of uh, prepared stuff to talk through. So we have plenty of time. Uh, I think this is all hat for maybe most of the folks here, right? LF is really, really quite broad. I joined 11 years ago, and we had eight projects. Uh, Linux, Zephyr, um, some of the embedded stuff, and it has exploded since then, right? So there's, a, you know, there's 200 projects today just within the Cloud Native uh, Foundation. I think there's almost 1,000 across all of the LF, uh, I think. We're one of these organizations where people get to know us from usually one particular area. So you might have the cloud native community. And they're quite surprised to find that we have a whole Linux Foundation networking group that's working on the 5G stack. And another group with LF Energy working about the energy transitions to sort of two-way dynamic uh, electric grids or Overture Maps, which is this global uh, attempt to build a reference data set for geospatial uh, um, information. So, we have over a dozen sub-foundations, of which the CNCF is one and arguably one of our most important ones with the focus on cloud native education. But as you can see, you know, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of different technology, there's a whole bunch of different um, sectors, and this by definition is what we call an eye chart, which is it's, you probably can't see the individual things, but the point is there's a lot, right? There's, if you scan down the left side, security, data, cloud, networking, edge, web, uh, visual effects as a whole, something called the Academy Software Foundation, which works on all the CGI stuff that you see in movies, and there's a whole bunch of different projects just in that one, but also hardware and standards. So historically, people think of the foundation as a software-driven foundation, but increasingly, we're kind of full stack across the technical spectrum, so software as well as hardware, and increasingly uh, standards. I talked about overture maps there uh, in the bottom, uh, but also things like AOUSD, the Alliance for Open USD, uh, the goal of which is as we get deeper into a sort of a 3D metaverse, how do we have portability? 
right? So we're at a point in time now with 3D rendering where uh, every asset you create is sort of trapped within the ecosystem that it was built in because there is not a portability layer. That's a great example of a project trying to establish a portability standard for 3D rendering so that things can be truly portable, just the way that they are with a browser today, right? And there's you know, browser standards that have allowed the web to be kind of fully portable and interoperable. Um, so there's, just, there's a lot going on, is the, is the point of the slide. And we get a lot of lenses into kind of what's happening in technology. Uh, just a little bit about kind of uh, my group, which is the education group. Um, you know, our goal is to make sure that projects are successful and that lack of technical talent is not a reason that to, to uh, a hindrance to, to accelerating adoption for projects, both from users and for developers. Uh, I don't know, quick show of hands, people aware of uh, the Kubernetes exams? Anybody taken CKA or CKD? It's a good example of like a endpoint that we've gotten to for like a really important technology that is, uh, all our material, all our training and in our exams, we put a very heavy premium on hands-on skills, right? And so the number one complaint I get when I talk to people about our portfolio is on our training, folks say, well, why is it so boring? Why are there no videos? I said, well, because if you want videos for entertainment, there's plenty of that on the internet. My, our job is to teach you how to use these projects. So we're very hands-on centric. We're kind of very lab centric. I think we view our role as making sure we develop technical talent that is able to then go out there and deploy these technologies. Uh, and as a result, we tend not to focus on a lot of the cool video type stuff. We tend to focus very heavily on uh, hands-on practice uh, lab simulations. And most importantly, we focus on basic technical competence. So when we talk about vendor neutral sort of nonprofit, there's a ton of content I don't care which open source project it is, the one thing that is not in short supply is technical content on the web, right? There's just about any project you can think of, there's 100 blog pages, there are lots of people kind of explaining it. Uh, can you trust the source? Do they have an agenda? Are they trying to sell a product? You know, what our group, our, our role is, is, is high quality vendor neutral uh, education. What is this technology? How can I use it? In practice, you probably end up using it in some sort of commercial packaging, and that's okay. But if you don't learn the basics, you'll never be a good consumer of what is ultimately packaged up uh, into the commercial um, product, right? So we really focus on that entry level, like do you really understand kind of what the technology is? Uh, so just a little bit on the trends. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of slides here with just stats on uh, despite what has been too I would argue rough years in terms of uh, larger companies in particular doing cutbacks. Uh, when you go out there and you speak to the market, there's still uh, pretty broad uh, talent shortages across, you know, this one is on industries and it's pretty consistent throughout, uh, but also true across geographies. Uh, so you can see uh, you know, Japan most acutely, but you know, Hong Kong's on here, China's on here. I think in most markets, there's pretty significant technical uh, talent shortages. And the, the topics that are most uh, 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 at risk are uh, technical IT data and soft skills, right? So collaboration. And so for those of us in the open source community, collaboration kind of comes first because that's how you get involved, right? You're in, your, in a repo and you're pulling stuff down, you're pushing stuff up. So I think the open source community is a very natural place to address uh, a shortage. And of course, there's particular topics, right? So uh, if you looked at the agenda, maybe half the talks are AI. Everybody wants to talk about AI and how we're going to use it. Uh, cybersecurity, also very much a hot point of discussion and, and organizations trying to figure out kind of how do I harden my stance? And maybe how do I do that in a way that isn't entirely reliant on, you know, CrowdStrike was great until it wasn't, and then there was a whole lot of disruption, right? And so there's definitely a need for technical talent in-house. You, you cannot outsource your problems 100% uh, to vendor partners. Like, it's great. A lot of times it's an, an important way to accelerate, but you have to retain uh, some basic capabilities. And in that particular case, people had to, as you all know, physically walk around to surface, right, and interrupt the stack and, and, and put the uh, patch in. Uh, so we do have these consistent package of technology, technical shortages of talent, and in part because so much more of the infrastructure that we roll out now is 
collaboratively developed by nature, right? So in the old days, you'd have a commercially successful platform that was driven by Oracle, or SAP, or Microsoft, and they would have a whole go-to-market agenda around it. In a world where a lot of the foundational technologies are collaboratively developed, there's really no commercial body sort of pushing that go-to-market education agenda, and some of that you see showing up in the technical talent shortages, in part because a lot of these technologies do not get covered thoroughly in computer science programs, right? So I'm often getting the complaint from people saying, I hired a new graduate, they've never really worked in cloud native or microservices before, how is that possible? I'm like, well, look at the curricula, right? There's just not room in standard. There's a few universities that do this well, but they are the exceptions, right? Most universities are not thoroughly covering you know, the, the, the modern infrastructure stack as part of their curriculum, and there's a lot of reasons why that's the case, to do with accreditation and uh, kind of what the cycle looks like. Uh, and, and then it's, the second big trend is Gen AI, right? So you had the first wave of reaction when first folks first saw Copilot and ChatGPT of saying, oh, well, now I won't need as many technical staff because just magically uh, all going to be uh, automated. And it's certainly going to be disruptive, right? And so uh, the way in which we're getting the work done is definitely going to change. I think if you look back over the long arc of technical development, it's almost never the case that you net end up with net less talent needs because the better the technology gets, the, better, the broader the adoption becomes, right? And so more companies become tech companies. You know, I had a great example of during the pandemic, my uh, favorite local Chinese restaurant in Austin which was literally this lady and her husband and a couple of cooks, and they used to write the orders on paper things and slide it back into the kitchen. And about a month after the pandemic started, they had a website that was taking orders and doing fulfillment. And I thought, wow, that is crazy. <laughs> like, how did she figure out how to build a website to take payments to send orders to the kitchen? But it's because the technology has become that much more accessible, right? She probably hired some you know, young kid that kind of came in and set it up and put it on the cloud and boom, they were an online business, right? So the footprint of the technology uh, is uh, broad. And I think one of the big questions has been, uh, what are my technical talent needs gonna be in aggregate? Am I gonna need less talent because I've got all this co-pilot stuff and it's churning out all this wonderful code? Uh, and so we ask this, we do this uh, state of tech talent report uh, we've been doing it for years. It used to be called the open source uh, jobs report. And what we realized is open source is so pervasive that it's actually no longer just the open source. It's the tech talent report. This is how technology gets uh, deployed. You know, 100% of the global cloud is running on Linux plus Kubernetes, right? And so we kind of pull back, change some of the questions. And it was interesting this year when we asked the question, what is the impact going to be? that about the same number, so 27% of organizations said they were, gonna, they were expecting to cut back, but 23% said they were expecting to ramp up. And a lot of that was organizations that maybe hadn't been using technology in the same way that were really intrigued about how could I use these technologies to deliver uh, my products and services in maybe a different way than what I had been doing. So the initial data is, pre is mixed in terms of what ultimately the impact is going to be. Uh, my personal opinion is looking back, you know, eight, nine years ago, there was a thought that we wouldn't need any engineers anymore because everybody was using the cloud and DevOps and deploying 20 times a day. And you know, all you were going to need was programmers. That's manifestly not true, <laughs> right? There's all kinds of places, you know, from platform engineering to, to deployment, to SRE. Uh, Sometimes it can be hard to envision, right? Like what that technical future is gonna look like in terms of the skill set. And the initial thought was, you know, I remember having multiple conversations about why do we need CKA? Because nobody needs that type of skill anymore, right? Everybody needs to be a developer. And of course, we now know that that, that is just not true, right? The, the footprint is getting bigger all the time. The specialization of the different types of skills you need is changing. And uh, I think Gen AI is, is, a, is just the latest in a long line of impactful technologies and people's first reaction is to worry about what, you know, what is that gonna mean for me, which is a natural human reaction. Uh, I think when we see this stuff play out over time, it almost always ends up the case that the, the velocity will go up, 
but the breadth of usage is going to go up. And the, un, you know, the things that we don't quite imagine today in terms of use cases are going to be the things that sort of take this and drive it so that there's much broader adoption, which means more technical skills. And so you know, my kids are 13 and 16, and the one thing I'm constantly telling them is the future is going to be tech enabled. And the other thing is it's going to be different tech every few years. So the, yeah, it used to be that you could be a Oracle engineer or a Nokia switch, uh, Ericsson switch person, and that, that, those days are gone. Like nobody's going to have a 30-year career on any one piece of technology anymore because the one thing we know is the velocity uh, of which stuff is coming out is not getting, it's not getting less. And so being able to ride the wave and figure out, OK, what are we going to do? What is this Gen AI, AI going to look like? In aggregate, it's probably not going to be a, uh, the major sort of get rid of all your people. Uh, you know, I like this quote that AI will specifically influence about five times the number of jobs that it eliminates. Right? We're, we're going to, yeah. There, there was a joke uh, years ago that we're all software uh, developers now. Well, we're all going to be you know, AI folks in, in, in one way or another kind of going forward. Uh, this is another bullet from the Tech Talent Report, uh, which I thought was interesting because one of the questions that, uh, or one of the concerns we get a lot is people saying that they, they have technical needs now and they want to be able to hire today. And when we talk to them about looking at your existing staff and thinking about how you could use those folks, the reaction is, I can't wait that long, right? I can't spend six months training that person up into cloud native skills. I need to hire today. The reality in this last survey is that it takes 10 months from the day you open the job rec on average to the day that person is identified, onboarded, trained, and, and, and uh, kind of deployed is 10 months. That's almost a year. And that's not even the bad news. Right? The bad news is that 40% of people are gone within 12 months. It takes you 10 months to get the person, hire them, place them in the role. 40% of those people are then gone within 12 months. And so there's this sort of fallacy of, well, I'll just hire, and it'll be easy, and I'll just you know, put somebody in, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll address this need. And nobody is saying, don't hire. But my argument is, be realistic, right? There is hiring external talent is not some sort of magic cure for the sort of technical needs that you have. Uh, you really need an all of the above strategy. And so when you think about you know, what the recruiting fees are going to be, how long is it going to take, how many of you thoroughly enjoy interviewing multiple people a day, half of whom are unqualified once they come in? Yeah, that's what I thought. Interviewing is brutal, right? I think mean, one of the things about thinking about your internal talent pool is there are people you know, right? There are people who have been part of the organization. Maybe they're in a different role. Maybe they're in a less technical role. But they're known quantities, right? They've been at the organization. They understand the culture. And so some of the, some of the reasons that 40% of people leave after they've been hired is things like cultural fit, right? They just didn't sort of mesh with the team. Uh, and so thinking about there's more than just external hiring you know, as a strategy for how you're going to uh, try to address your organization's needs is, I think, something that organizations, frankly, should do more of. Uh, you know, the, uh, now, it's, it's true that if you're going to invest in what we call upskilling and cross-skilling, it's going to take time. Right? But it takes time today. It takes time to go through and screen. You know, we just hired somebody. We got 800 resumes. And the, the person who was hiring it just kind of stared at it for a minute. And it's like, OK, how? And I think I ended up putting some of it into chat GPT and trying to like sort through. Right? It's, just, it's really painful a lot of times to hire. It's not pain free to upskill, but there's great payoff if, uh, if you're doing it uh, the right way. And because of the impact of, of uh, some of these Gen AI and some of these LLMs, I think people have a sense that there's pockets in the organization where there's going to be some capacity being freed up, right? So people who are maybe doing some of the more routine type tasks, uh, you might not need as many of them. I would argue, go look at those folks and see who do you think has technical aptitude. Put them on a six-month plan to train them up into you know, the basics of 
cloud native stuff, right? Try to figure out where are those pools of talent of people that are already part of the organization. And maybe they will, you know, in their current day job get displaced over the next kind of year or so. Great. Consider that your talent pool, right? Go get those folks, put them in a program, uh, cultivate that over time, because you were going to spend 10 months hiring externally anyway. You might as well spend eight months training folks up. And the other big concern that you get is people saying, oh, well, I'm just going to train them, and then they're going to leave. People always leave. Uh, train two of them, right? You're not going to lose half of them, right? And so the, when you think about the sort of time and the cost, investing in internal development of folks is not as risky as I think people have tended to think. And trying to bring talent from the outside is not as simple as people have been as, uh, have tended to think, right? And so I think what we argue is think holistically. You know, nobody is saying don't hire. You're always going to want to go outside and bring in fresh ideas, but don't treat that as the only source of technical talent. You know, really be mindful, especially that we're on, now that we're on the cusp of some changes to workflows and ability to maybe automate more things. Think about those talent pools that are within your organization and how can you identify some of those folks who've been good, who've been productive, who understand the culture, and how can you maybe move those folks up and kind of upskill them up uh, into different roles. Uh, so we talk about two different things. We talk about upskilling and cross-skilling. And the way I de describe it is uh, cross-skilling is you know, the folks who are in your organization running the .NET apps that were written in the 90s. There's a lot of it. <laughs> a huge amount of computing is stuff written in the 90s and 2000s because it's not sexy. Nobody wants to go to their board and ask for $20 million to redo the inventory system that works just fine today. But we all know that it's not going to last forever, right? And then, you know, the Solaris was a great example, right? Sun said like 15 years ahead of time that they were sunsetting Solaris. And the day Solaris went into no longer supported mode, there were dozens of companies panicking about all the stack of stuff that I have running on Solaris. And so, you know, we're going to have to move some of these legacy loads cross-skilling those folks who have been running those legacy apps, those monolithic apps, to figure out how do I factor down? Uh, how do I make those apps into microservices one piece at a time and sort of gradually move it over the next few years is an important part of the strategy. And frankly, as a tech leader, you, you come out ro looking roses if you can go into your CEO and say, hey, over the last two years, we completely refactored all this stuff, and I did it with my existing staff. You're welcome. Uh, you know, the, there's going to have to be a need for some of that cross-skilling uh, and then you know, upskilling of some of these pools, right? So some of these pools of folks where the jobs might be displaced. Uh, embrace the Gen AI. It's, you know, if there's places where you can do the work more efficiently, absolutely do that more efficiently. But be thinking about these talent pools that are available to you and you know, who can you pick, right? Who's shown promise? Uh, because you know we've worked. You know these are folks you work with, right, in different capacities. Like try to identify the folks that have kind of technical talent um, that you might be able to tap into. Uh, and then longer term, think about the mix of resources. Uh, I'm often surprised at the amount of money organizations will spend on headhunters and not give it second thought. You know, 20% of salary, 30% of salary. You know. In some markets, you're talking about people who come in at salaries of $125,000 a year. You're spending $40,000 on a recruiter for somebody who has a 40% chance that they'll be gone a year later. And nobody questions the budget. You ask for $20,000 to train employees, and you know people look at you like you have two heads. Like, what's wrong with this picture? It's like, you just spend 40K on a recruiter. You won't spend 25K on talent development. Uh, and some of that just history, right, and what people are used to. Like, there's a budget for recruiters, so I'm just going to use that budget. And I often tell companies, I was like, you know what? Just repurpose a little bit of your recruiting budget. Take $50,000 and see how it goes, because you would have blown that on one hire. You could cross-train a dozen people for that, right? And so really think, you know, yesterday's budget doesn't have to be a prison for tomorrow's talent development. And, and you know, it's true that there's a lot of buckets, uh, and there's a lot of budgets um, in places. You know, as somebody who's worked in education for 20 plus years, it's always the first thing that gets cut. 
right? And people go through, it's like, oh, where can we cut? Event travel, you know, nobody needs to go to Hong Kong this year, training. Uh, but, you know, when you're in periods of high disruption, investing in technical talent is never a bad payoff. And so trying to find kind of where some of those buckets are. And then how do you retain people, right? By giving them exposure, by giving them a chance to work on what it's perceived as the new sexier technologies. They will stay because you know, they can't go somewhere else and start from scratch and sort of reposition themselves as an AI person. So give them a chance to come and work on some of these new technologies. You know, they'll deliver benefits to your organization. And if two years down the line they decide to move on, that's OK, because two years down the line you might decide to promote them. Right? And so this fear that people have all long had about upskilling the existing workforce because they think they might leave, I would argue is like vastly overrated. You know, a lot of people will stay and, and do the right things. And then broaden the technical pool, right? We do get a lot of folks that uh, they have a list of schools they recruit from. And you know, <laughs> it just blows my mind that, that folks will only look at these five schools. There's a massive amount of talent on, you know, one of the, best performing folk person, uh, uh, people on my team is a guy who, for the first part of his career, was a, was a welder. But he was really technical and was always like playing with stuff. And during COVID, built a website for his wife because she was doing like this craft type business. And uh, actually, she applied for him <laughs> to the role that we had. And uh, I remember when they screened it, they said, you know, this guy doesn't have like a traditional background, but he's pointed to like a couple of cool GitHub repos, like we should bring him in. Killing it. Yeah, apprentice as a welder, had his whole career. There was nothing in his like academic background that suggested that he was going to be just a killer developer on this stuff. But there he is. He's a killer developer on this stuff. And he's done and actually on AI, a whole bunch of stuff for us on like how do we fit, use AI and bring it into our exam development process and uh, use it to sort of kickstart the process. And so non-traditional pools of people, yeah, organizations are going to have to get out their comfort zone, right? I'll, I'll, I'll blame HR a little bit because a lot of HR and people organizations can have these processes and these screening forms. It's like, oh, well, these are the places we tend to recruit. Like you should really look there. Collectively, we have got to start looking in more places for technical talent. There's amazing technical talent that didn't go through one of those six universities that doesn't have a resume of spending five years. You know, I always joke with folks that everybody wants to hire themselves five years ago. Right? And it's like, oh, if I could only find a younger me, like this would be great. We've got to have more imagination than that when we think about technical talent. Right? There's, there's a lot of talent out there. Uh, kind of you know, bubbling up that we're not accessing today because we're continuing to use last year's staffing models to try to solve tomorrow's problems. Uh, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's happening in the region. I think you guys have probably hopefully heard about the Cubestronaut program. We were trying to like lift the level of visibility for folks who are really investing in some of these new technologies. Uh, you know, they, the cool thing about this is we're starting to get more and more population of folks uh, out of Asia. And if you guys, hopefully you've seen a couple of folks with their blue Cubestronaut jackets. I think we've uh, awarded a couple of folks here on site this week. Um, you know, these are the folks that, you know, it doesn't matter what their resume say, and it doesn't matter if they went to a prestigious university. They're the ones doing the work, right? They're the ones demonstrating their skill kind of day in, day out. That's it. That, you know, if I'm a hiring manager, I'm much more impressed than this than I am by you graduating from Tsinghua or Peking, <laughs> because you, you're showing me that you can actually do the work. I don't care if you're a welder; like it doesn't matter to me, right? Like, uh, can you actually uh, do the work? Uh, and we're trying to do more of this. We're trying to, to uh, profile more success stories of people who've come from sort of less traditional backgrounds. Juan Manuel was a great example. He kind of came up through the ranks in, uh, in Chile. Uh, there's a lot of people like this. Uh, the more we can do to sort of celebrate the success of some of these non-traditional candidates so that other people can kind of see a pathway to like, huh, maybe I could be a developer, right? Maybe I could be an, uh, an AI type person. Uh, yeah. If we don't open the doors wider to get more people in, 
We're going to be back here next year complaining about the lack of AI talent. We're going to be back here next year complaining about the lack of cloud talent. The talent is out there. I think it's kind of our job to go figure out kind of where are these people in maybe the less traditional places, where are these people within our existing organizations maybe doing something different today, and take the time to invest in them, like, like invite, you know, assign somebody to be their mentor, to give them feedback, to kind of coach them up through the process. And so, you know, the same things we do in open source development where we encourage each other and give feedback on pull requests and kind of pull people up and kind of build them up is the same thing we sh should be doing kind of more broadly with uh, technical talent. Uh, I put the link up here for the tech talent report. You guys can download it if you haven't seen it already. There's lots of little infographics like the ones that I shared in there uh, that, you know, if you're in a position to try to persuade people in your organization to maybe tackle some of these things. They're great little data points to have uh, to just kind of encourage folks to think differently, right? To do something different than what I did last year, right? Don't just try to recruit, don't just pay headhunters, like, you know, be more creative in thinking about how can we fill those gaps? How can we use people we already have? How can we go to non-traditional places? Uh, you know, and every now and again, still hire. Like, it's all of the above, right? I think mean, being, taking a broader lens on how we're going to get this talent and, and, and thinking about something different than what we did last year is going to be critically important so we don't come back year after year kind of complaining about the same problems, right? The, the, the lack of talent, the, you know, the inability to hire, the fact that people are getting poached by the guy down the street for, you know, a dollar, you know, an hour more. Uh, you know, we're going to have to take more kind of agency uh, into our own hands when, when we think about the technical talent side of things. Uh, I think that might be my last slide. Uh, I left for us to say, so we have uh, Maggie's here. Uh, Yang Hin, I think, is maybe in the back. We have representation uh, in China so that you can get folks uh, with local language skills, so that you can transact in local currency uh, if you need that, so that you have folks to call, uh, technical support for folks who are kind of taking programs. So, um, you know, as a, as a global organization, we try to be responsive, right? And so there's, uh, you know, we don't need that same level of support in India because people are, you know, take it in English and kind of work with us there. But, the, you know, in markets like China and markets like Japan, we, we, we do try to invest in additional resources to, resources to make sure that the programs are available, that there's people locally that you can uh, talk to. Uh, so we've, we've got a China website. Uh, Everybody's on WeChat here. You can grab them on WeChat. Uh, uh, you know, we really want to make sure that access uh, to the curriculum and to the programs we offered is not limited. And so, uh, you know, we, we've been making a particular effort in the China market to try to make sure that we're available to you um, as you need us. I think that's my last slide. Um, it is. Uh, I'll put down the mic if anybody has questions now from the full group. If not, can you come up to me afterwards? Uh, I appreciate your interest. This is largely a technical conference, so it's not always the uh, highest interest thing to, to come talk about kind of technical talent and, and the people side of it. But that's kind of the, that's, my, that's the world I live in is the people side of it. So I really appreciate uh, the time, the attention, the, the attendance, and have a great rest of your KubeCon. Hope you get some great sessions and some great insights. Right. Thank you.